hour, it's been an hour to spend uh, with you, and so we definitely want to hear what you're, uh, what you have to say. Uh, what I would ask you to do is identify yourself for the record uh, before you start speaking. So, Seth, welcome. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Just a quick logistic question. I, I'd like to get on yeah. Wi-Fi here. Is that just statehouse underscore public? Yes, that's probably your best way to go. Okay. <coughs> just give me one second. Google document. So what's the name of this? Okay. Um, did you want me to email it to you then? Could you do that real quick? I, it, sure. it wouldn't give nope. me permission okay. to open it. Okay, I'm sorry. Do you want to project something on that? Do you want no, to project something on that? I mean, you've got, you got a plug right there if you want to. <coughs> no, that, that's okay. I don't need to do it. I don't need to do a projection. Okay, well, I'll just send it to you now. Uh, I'm sorry, I would have come in sooner, but I popped my head in and I, I thought there was another meeting going on. Well, people just barge in <laughs> in, this, in this joint. You know, you just kind of come in, you make yourself known. <coughs> okay, so um, I'm, I'm ready now. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so remember, just identify yourself for the record, right. like who you are and maybe your business name. Right, okay. And that's actually part of my opening testimony as well. So um, my name is Seth Itzkan. The last name is spelled I-T-Z-K-A-N. And I'm the co-founder and co-director of a Vermont-based nonprofit called Soil for Climate. Is it possible I could get a little glass of water or something like that? Sure. I could get you. Where is um, that? From? Oh, by the um, in the cafeteria, there's a sink with water coming. To the right of the Coca-Cola machine. Thank you. <coughs> um, so, I have a prepared statement. It will only take five minutes to read. And sure. I just emailed it to it, and she's looking copies now. So, should I Great. just proceed? Sure. Okay. Um, should we introduce ourselves before? Or? Um, we could. Okay. Um, sure, that, this will give Carl a chance to get back to the yeah. water. <laughs> okay. Rodney? Rodney Vera from Williamstown. <coughs> We've got Williamstown, South Sea, <coughs> Washington, Orange, and Liberty. Okay. This would be Mark Higley. He's Lowell, Troy, Jay. Uh, I'm, Jay I'm Jay Hooper, uh, <laughs> Brookfield, Brazier, and up here in Roxbury. Sue Buckles, uh, Barnard, Pomfrey, West Hartford, and Queechee. John Bartholomew from Heartland, also representing the Windsor and West Windsor. Um, Carolyn Partridge, I represent Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of Northwest Minster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. Dick Lawrence from London, <coughs> also representing Burke and Sutton. Amy Sheldon from Middle Ground. Uh, Terry Norris, I represent Madison and Rutland. Harvey Smith from New Haven. I represent uh, Weybridge and Bridgeport as well. I'm Tom Bach from Chester. I represent Chester Andover, Baltimore, and part of North Springfield. Great. Well, thank you for those introductions. Um, okay, so I'll read this now. It should take about five minutes. Sure. Um, testimony to the Vermont House Committee on Agriculture and Forestry regarding soil for climate, soil as a climate solution, regenerative agriculture, and benefits for Vermont agriculture and water management. Um, today's date. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the Vermont House Committee on Agriculture and Forestry. It is my honor and pleasure to present before you today. My name is Seth Itzcan. I'm the co-founder and co-director of Soil for Climate, a Vermont-based educational nonprofit with chapters and influence around the globe. I am here with my colleague, Soil for Climate co-founder and co-director, Carl Tiedemann. Soil for Climate advocates for soil as a climate solution. 
As far as we know, we are the only organization that specifically focuses on the propagation of this core theme, soil for climate. We are blessed to have an advisory board comprised of several of the world's leading soil and climate scientists and regenerative farming practitioners. Soil for Climate was born of the necessity to seek natural solutions to the problem of carbon dioxide overload in the atmosphere. Although emissions reduction e efforts are essential and laudable, they are not on their own adequate to avert a global warming catastrophe. Research has shown we are already past the point of inevitable climate impacts. The emission reduction efforts must be complemented with extensive and sustained drawdown, that is, actively removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Fortunately, soil is a suitable reservoir for this excess atmospheric carbon, and agricultural management practices are available to accelerate the necessary capture. In addition, the enrichment of soil with carbon not only mitigates the climate threat, it also provides numerous environmental and farming benefits that would be of practical interest to the state. As one example, this would greatly increase the capacity of land to hold water. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, and other sources, a 1% increase of soil organic matter enables, enables an acre of land to hold an additional 20,000 gallons of water. The same improvement to soil also corresponds to a drawdown of approximately 17 metric <coughs> tons of carbon dioxide, equivalent to eliminating 40,000 miles driven by an average car. Again, these are the benefits from a 1% increase in soil organic matter on just one acre. Applied to a larger region, such as Franklin County, with an area of approximately 440,000 acres, the corresponding quantities quickly become quite large and the true benefits of increasing soil carbon become much more apparent. For example, if the soil organic matter content of all of Franklin County were increased by 1%, this would correspond to an additional water holding capacity of 9 billion gallons and a drawdown of 7.5 million tons of carbon dioxide, equivalent to the emissions from 1.5 million cars per year. How much is 9 billion gallons of water? It's about 150 times the yearly processing volume of the Montpelier Water Treatment Plant, which handles 1 million gallons per day. We can also look at this in terms of rates. Research has shown that with proper management practices, agricultural soils can add a ton of carbon per acre per year. According to data from 2012, Vermont's CO2 footprint was 8.2 million tons per year. This equates to 2.3 million tons of carbon. As a, at a typical drawdown rate of one ton of carbon per acre per year, Franklin County alone could offset 20% of all of Vermont's emissions, transportation, residential, and industrial. An additional benefit to increasing soil organic matter is that this improves the quality and quantity of food produced on farms, as well as providing enhanced resilience during times of drought and flooding. It also makes crops more resistant to pests. Thus, because of the many benefits of increasing soil organic carbon, in addition to mitigating climate threat, and in consideration of the relatively inexpensive and risk-free nature of this approach, all measures to naturally increase soil organic matter should be encouraged. Vermonters may rightly consider this the catamount's meow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, questions for Seth right now? For Seth or Carl. Thank you. Okay. Carl, did you want to also present, because I have you on the list. Yes, I did not have a separate prepared statement, but I would be happy to uh, you know, respond to any questions or to complement Seth's answers as appropriate. So your nonprofit is called Soil for Climate. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started, either one of you? Sure, I'll, I'll start, Carl can add on. Um, we, we both come from um, sort of non-farming, if you will, backgrounds. I have an engineering degree, Carl has a chemistry degree, um, and, but we were both very interested in, in the climate problem. And like most people who are interested in that problem, you know, in the last 15 years or so, we were focused on first trying to convince people it's real, but also trying to, to mitigate the emissions, trying to say we have to stop emissions. But in 2009, a seminal paper um, was published 
by Susan Solomon of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration titled Irreversible Climate Change Due to Carbon Dioxide Emissions. And she said we're already past the point where stopping emissions is going to be good enough. And then in 2013, the IPCC released a paper saying um, we need large and sustained drawdown efforts. And so the narrative, if you will, in, in the climate movement is sort of changing. And then um, there was a, a flurry of sort of techno fixes um, and, and other sort of desperate means called geoengineering, where they want to spray aerosol, aerosols in the sky, or they want to seed the oceans with iron to stimulate algae blooms. And all these things are high risk and high uncertainty. Meanwhile, there was this whole other community of soil scientists who have been saying for decades, I mean, even since the late 70s, they've been saying soil carbon is, is the answer. We need to increase soil carbon. And um, all of a sudden, people are beginning to pay attention to them now. And so the, the purpose of our organization was to complement all the great climate work that's going out there, the 350.org, and all of that's necessary, but to say we also need to have these drawdown solutions. And not only that, we've been learning as we go along, we've been saying this is, this is fantastic. These are farmers, these are regenerative ag people. There are so many co-benefits. It's not even about climate for so many people. A lot of people who are doing this don't even necessarily believe that climate is a problem. And you know what? You don't have to convince them that it is. They can see that their crops are doing better, that they're having less erosion. Um, you know, they're doing the better practice anyway. So, so we're in support of this as, as an ag solution and, and as a health solution and as a, as a farmland solution, you know, whether or not people buy into the, the climate part of it. But, but that is, anyway, that's, that's how we got into it ourselves. So are you currently farming? Huh, I wish. No, no, unfortunately, I'm, I'm an armchair, you know, uh, evangelist, um, you know, like so many people. But, but I've been going all over the world to visit farms. I mean, I have made this my vocation. I've been to Africa. Um, I've been all over the United States. So I've been all over Vermont, you know, seeing people who are doing great stuff. And there is great stuff happening here. Unfortunately, I don't own the right land for farming, but uh, I can see it in my future. Yeah. Tom. Describe the process, how the carbon comes out of my tailpipe and into the ground. Is that what's happening here? Oh, well, why don't you pick that one? Sure, I'll do that too. Um, once the carbon dioxide in the Carl, atmosphere, the way you that, just say your name for the yeah, to identify. Sure. We, we tape everything, and I want people to know who's speaking. Thanks. Um, my name is Carl Tiedemann, and I'm the co-founder and co-director of Soil for Climate along with Seth and Scott. Um, the way that nature has been removing carbon from the atmosphere literally since plants and soils first appear on the planet uh, is through the process. Um, many of us learn about it in school, but I don't think, at least based on my experience, get the full understanding, but, but a photosynthesis. Um, as a plant grows, it takes in carbon dioxide through the leaves. Inside the plant, uh, it turns the carbon dioxide, the plant itself turns the carbon dioxide uh, into sugars. And some of these sugars are then exuded through the roots. You can think in terms of maple syrup, if you will. Um, some plants, in fact, up to 40% or more of their photosynthetic energy that they capture from the sun is released in the form of sugars to the ground. Um, it may sound odd, but why would a plant give away all this food, essentially, this free food? And in fact, what it's doing is feeding the underground soil life because through a co-evolutionary process over millions upon millions of years, uh, the underground soil life has become dependent on its food source from, from the plant roots. Uh, once the, um, the sugar is essentially leaked into the ground, uh, bacteria and fungi um, in the ground, mycelium, uh, then take it up. And if you've ever pulled a plant from the ground uh, from very healthy soil, you can see along the roots there are these small nodes. And it turns out that each one of these nodes is a small chemical factory where there's slightly anaerobic or low oxygen conditions that are conducive to turning uh, this sugar syrup uh, into what are called phospholipids, which is essentially, it's a, a a, bio, um, a biological plastic, if you will. Uh, not all of the uh, carbon that goes into the ground is, is tr um, treated in this way. You know, much of it is, is taken up and just eaten by the bugs and to feed the underground life and so on. But in terms of making soil, uh, 
And something I've learned from Australian scientist uh, Christine Jones, who has a wonderful uh, interview um, with her on, let's see if you can find it at her website, called, called amazingcarbon.com, which I thought was uh, a little uh, hyperbolic until, you know, the more I've learned about carbon, I've realized, well, it is quite amazing. Um, but she explains that uh, most carbon gets into the soil through this method, which she has named the liquid carbon pathway. Uh, many of us, myself as a home gardener, for decades thought that the way the carbon got into the ground was from leaves falling off the trees or the compost that you spread, and then the compost would break down and some of the carbon would go into the ground. But she explains, no, that virtually all of the carbon in the compost goes back into the atmosphere. But while the compost, for example, is sitting on the ground, it's helping to shade the soil and hold the moisture in the soil so that the soil life can do its thing. So um, to reiterate, through photosynthesis, the carbon gets put in underground, and most of what we think of as soil is actually being produced about 12 to 14 inches or so beneath the ground surface rather than at the top layer of the, of the ground itself. And I'm sorry to be so long-winded. I can be this way sometimes. But I hope that answers your question. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> other questions for Seth or Carl at this point? Amy. Have you worked with other states on um, I'm, I'm actually in your poster child for my regenerative ag bill. It's the last chance for everyone on the committee who wants to sign on. <laughs> Bill deadline for today, the modeled after one that's on the Senate side. Um, other states doing work like this are, are models that we could look to for other countries? Uh, um, absolutely. Um, Carl, let me talk about it at the international level and then you talk about the other states as well. Sure. So it's, it's um, at all levels. Um, Carl actually just gave testimony a couple weeks ago in Connecticut, so we're kind of flying around. Um, but just quickly, at the international level, there is something called four per thousand. Um, it's 4p1000.org, but it stands for four parts of carbon per one per thousand parts of soil. In other words, it, it's an aspirational goal to increase soil carbon by 0.4%. Um, and this is an international effort that was just launched at COP22 in Marrakesh in December. COP is the, stands for the Conference of Parties of the UN International um, um, Conference Associations, and you can help me with this. Intergovernmental Panel, Intergovernmental Panel, Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, <laughs> COP. So um, that was offic officially launched sort of aspirational program, different countries can put different money behind it. But so there's a goal now of increasing <laughs> soil carbon, and this is being launched at a climate conference. So that's very exciting. Um, the, the Commonwealth of Nations, the 52 member states of the former British Empire are working on their own program now. Um, there was a Healthy Soils Initiative in the United States a few months ago. I don't know what the status of that is now. Um, but th but there was a healthy soils initiative. You mean at like uh, federal agencies? Yeah, at the federal level, um, you can still find it online. Um, not at whitehouse.gov where it used to be, um, but it's still there in archives and and getting to the state level. Quite a bit is happening. So Carl, why don't you jump in on that? Sure. And um, a, a useful resource along this line might be our our website, uh, soilforclimate.org. We do have a special page set up on policy. And um, I'll just share because we have some quotes here from the various legislation. So uh, at present in California, Oklahoma, and Utah, uh, there's already legislation that's been passed um, in, from California. Uh, California's Healthy Soil Initiative is a collaboration of state agencies and departments led by the California Department of Food and Agriculture to promote the development of healthy soils in California's farm and ranch lands. Innovative and ranch management, management practices contribute to building adequate soil organic matter that can increase carbon sequestration and reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, from Oklahoma, uh, they have the Carbon Sequestration Enhancement Act. Uh, quote, Oklahoma is the first state in the U.S. to give a state agency statutory authority to verify and certify carbon offsets. The Oklahoma Conservation Commission is authorized under Oklahoma Administrative Code uh, Title I-55 or, or 155 and so on which authorizes the commission to establish and administer a carbon sequestration certification program. The Oklahoma Carbon Program pairs natural resource protection with sectors that form the economic backbone of the state, agriculture, forestry, and oil and gas. And in Utah, they have the concurrent restoration on carbon sequestration on range land. Uh, quote, this concurrent resolution of the legislature and the governor 
calls on the President of the United States to direct federal agencies that implement management practices that increase soil carbon sequestration to develop comprehensive plans that achieve the maximum amount of carbon <coughs> sequestration possible and increase the economic and environmental productivity of rangelands and urges similar action within each state. Um, as I've mentioned, I, earlier this month, I uh, had the honor to give testimony at the Connecticut State House. I've learned quite recently, although I don't yet have any details on it, uh, there's a similar effort on the foot in New York, um, but I believe that's on a county basis rather than statewide at this point. And Seth and I have had several meetings over the last few weeks relative to um, proposed uh, legislation that has not yet compiled uh, in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, specifically on regenerative soils as well. Other questions for Seth and Carl right now? We have one more guest to come. Are you Keith? No, I'm Keith. 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 Hi. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so maybe we'll, we'll have Keith come up and then uh, at the end, uh, maybe we can ask all, you know, anyone in the room question if that works for you. Yeah? So please. Okay, so Keith Morris, come right up. Um, and Keith. Uh, is from Prospect Rock Permaculture. 